Can you tell me something? Was it all for nothing? Can't keep myself from wondering. Was it all for nothing? So one thing to know about me is that I am nosy. I'm about as nosy as Pinocchio when he's telling a lie. And the other thing to know about me is that I live in London. And that means when I'm not on YouTube, I'm on the tube. The London Underground. London's subway, metro system, it's the most efficient way of getting around the city, and so I spend quite a lot of my time on there. And so, when you combine these two things, <laughs> you get this video, apparently. And basically, I always see other people, strangers to me, reading books on the London Underground, on the train, and I wanna know if those books are any good. I wanna know if these random strangers have good taste in literature. And so, <laughs> This is so dumb. This week, I am going to be getting the tube, seeing what people are reading, and then reading those books. And I'll let you know what I think. That- this isn't weird. You're weird. Anyway, let's go see what some strangers are reading. I don't know what you think about me with him, and it's hard to believe I stayed here when he told me to leave. Was sincere about everything, but you took me for granted. Sat down and waited, girl, I get to stand it. Hopped off the train, I was calling your name, and you looked at me crazy like we never had any day. So let's stop. Don't wanna see you so pissed off. Try to be happy, but guess what, girl, it's impossible. Please, can you let up? Can you Houston, I think we have a problem. And that problem is my terrible vision because I'm trying to see what people are reading and I'm like squinting at them. And in the process, I think it looks like. I'm plotting to kill them. Okay, update. I've made it home and I have had a bit more of a success on my return journey because the person sitting opposite me was reading a book called Rodham. Thankfully, the text on the cover is quite big. And Rodham is basically a book which imagines what Hillary Clinton's life would have been like if she hadn't married Bill Clinton. So, quite intrigued by that and that's gonna be the first book that I read for this video. Also, I am absolutely buzzing to let you know that today's video is very kindly sponsored by BBC Sounds. You guys know by now how much I love BBC Sounds. It is the home of BBC Live Radio, great podcasts and music mixes, all curated by the best of the BBC's talent. So many great options on here. I love listening to the Focus Beats music mix when I'm just trying to get work done and be productive. But today, my podcast of choice is going to be Have You Heard George's Podcast, which is a podcast by George the Poet, where he basically talks about city life through music and storytelling. And it's very cool. So this is what's gonna be in my ears. Whenever I'm traveling anywhere, if I'm not reading a book, I'm listening to a podcast always. And so for all of this content, all in one place, make sure you check out BBC sounds online and on the app. And for now, I have got a book to get around to reading and I'm hoping that it's gonna be quite good. Yeah, guys, <laughs> this was not good. This was not good at all. I wanted to enjoy it so much, but I just found it uncomfy. Firstly, I'm unsure about my opinions on the ethics of writing a fictional book about someone who is very much still alive because this is essentially Hillary Clinton fan fiction, which it's not something I thought I'd ever be reviewing on my YouTube channel, but here we are. And I have to say, if this book was written about me, I would be insulted. Like, honestly, how are you gonna write 400 pages about someone and their main defining characteristic is that they're just dull? <laughs> Tell me why I was reading this and fantasizing about the prospect of paint drying. It's also weird because the whole point of this book is what if Hillary hadn't married Bill? And yet, Bill Clinton is still a highly prominent character throughout this book, both as a politician and as a love interest. So for me, it didn't really deviate enough from the real world that we all kind of know about, especially given that it's essentially speculative fiction. I think the point here is that people have often said in the media or in public discourse that Hillary Clinton was holding Bill back, whereas the point of this book is basically to turn those tables and say, actually, Bill was holding Hillary back this whole time. But Rodham does go on to suggest that Donald Trump would have been a collaborator of Hillary Clinton. It's all just quite strange and I thought a bit distasteful, but the main thing that I wanted to say about this book is that I never ever Ever, 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 for as long as I live, never again do I want to read another Bill and Hillary Clinton sex scene. I am scarred. It's not even about who they are, it's how they're written. Like if a book has got me missing Wattpad fan fiction, something has gone terribly wrong. These sex scenes are written in the most wooden, icky way. They genuinely made my dick go inside itself, I swear. Never before have I read a consensual sex scene that made me consider celibacy. I was like, get me to the nearest church, I need cleansing. Like, tell me why I'm sitting here reading Bill Clinton playing the saxophone naked as foreplay. 
I give up. I give up. I feel like my virginity grew back just reading that. Curtis Sittenfield, I want a written apology from you. And I feel like this is punishment for taking my recommendations from random strangers reading on the tube. Okay, maybe I'm being a bit harsh. I gave this two out of five stars because there are some, some redeeming elements to this book because there are moments in here which are quite impactful and have a really strong feminist message, especially regarding how society as a whole perceives professional women, unmarried women, and also women who um, exhibit assertiveness. And I did enjoy reading the author's imaginations of the private thoughts of a person who is so publicly scrutinized constantly throughout their career. But overall, I kind of just hated this because it's so slow paced. It's so repetitive. There are so many political campaign cycles with such vivid details and unnecessary tangents. We get introduced to so many characters who are just completely inconsequential to the narrative. And it honestly just felt <laughs> like a bit of a waste of time. Was this made with a spirit level? Because it's falling flat for me. And I would love to know what the opinion was of the person I saw reading this on the tube. Did they love it? Did they hate it? I don't know. Either way, this is all their fault. And so I really need to redeem myself here with a cracking recommendation. So I am heading out tonight. I'm going to the pub and I'll see what Londoners are reading. So let's go. I wrote out all my feelings in a text but never sent it Telling you how deeply I'm obsessed and girl I meant it mm -hmm. But you only see him and I'm not him If it's impossible to open up your eyes No way to make you realize Okay, so the bookworms were out in full force tonight and I saw not one, not two, but three people, three whole people reading Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. I feel like this is kind of like the book of the season. By the way, am I about to be arrested? Like what's going on here? And I actually have a copy in my flat, so I think it was meant to be. It's about time I got around to reading it and I'm glad this video has encouraged me to do so. So I will let you know what my thoughts are when I'm done. <sighs> Oh my lord. This book was heartbreaking and devastating and an easy five stars. So thank you, random lady on the train. This is of course Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell and this was the worthy winner of the 2020 Women's Prize for Fiction. And this is a book all about the family of a little known indie writer called William Shakespeare. These are the people that he left behind when he moved from Stratford to London to be a playwright. So we follow his three children, Judith, Susanna, and Hamnet, and also his wife, Agnes, who is more commonly known to us as Anne Hathaway, but her father in his will, I think, referred to her as Agnes, and so that is why the author refers to her as Agnes here. Shakespeare himself is never actually referred to by name. He's always the husband, the father, the playwright. And I think that omission is done very, very intentionally because Normally the focus is on him and people's relationships to him. Instead of Shakespeare's son, we have Hamnet. Instead of Shakespeare's wife, we have Agnes. And I think that empowers and validates them as characters and human beings in their own right with stories that are worth hearing. A huge theme in this book is grief and loss. And it's explored in such a dazzling and outstanding way. And yeah, I'm gonna say it. I think this is going to become a modern classic because it is so bold and ambitious, but executed remarkably. The title of this book obviously alludes to Shakespeare's son, who is often forgotten by history, but literally lends his name to one of the most well-known plays of all time. I mean, Shakespeare did change Hamlet to Hamlet. He really said, it's the remix. But the main character of this book is really Hamnet's mother, Agnes, who is this really free-spirited, enigmatic woman who is famous in the town that they live in for her herbal remedies. They see her as almost like mystical. Honestly, she's just a badass. And at points, the writing is just jaw-dropping. So it's a yes from me. So let's go see what more people are reading. Was it all for nothing? Can't keep myself from wondering. Today in London is boiling. Susan boiling. But I've just got home and the person who was sitting next to me on the tube was reading Small Pleasures by Claire Chambers, which I actually have somewhere. <laughs> somewhere maybe over there. Obviously, I didn't actually ask what the person sitting next to me thought of the book because speaking to someone on the London Underground is actually illegal. That would have been reckless behavior. That is social suicide. It would be like standing on the left side of the escalator. You, d you don't do it. Anyway, I got some reading to do. 
and we are done. First and foremost, before anything else, can I get a chef kiss up in here for that cover? Small Pleasures is a light, tender, beautiful novel. And it's all about a journalist working at a small local paper who is covering an article about a woman who claims she had a virgin birth. She girl bossed a bit too close to the sun. And while investigating that story and that sort of bubbling away in the background, we get these really intricate descriptions of domestic life all set in the 1950s. We also get an insight into like personal relationships and as the title suggests, the small pleasures of life. I have a little soft spot in my heart for novels like this, where we witness ordinary people finding joy and finding pleasure in ordinary things. Because it makes you appreciate that you can find satisfaction in your own little life. Like, you don't have to be a world famous superstar or a pioneer to be extraordinary. And equally, you don't have to be extraordinary to be loved or to enjoy the life that you have. That being said, the ending of this book is so rogue. It was as if the final chapter of Small Pleasures belonged to a different book entirely. I'm, I'm still honestly confused about it and I can't understand why that was, that a choice was made and it was not a good one. For me, if the significance of the ending has to be explained in an afterword by the author, maybe it wasn't that well thought out. I'm really trying to explain this without spoilers, but like the final little bit has nothing to do with the other like 300 pages of the story that we've just read. It just, I think it did a disservice to the general tone and the general vibe that this book gave me. There's also a few problematic elements, like at one point a woman leaves her husband for another woman and she's kind of villainized as of that moment, she becomes really miserable and sad, basically just for being true to herself and her desires. And although it does advance the story, I felt like it could have been done in different ways, or at least more delicately. So. This week we have had a real mixed bag. This was a fun way to pick books to read though, so I would actually recommend. Normalize being nosy. Normalize reading books purely because strangers on the train were reading them. <laughs> of course, a massive shout out to BBC Sounds for working with me on this video and making it happen. I appreciate you so much and the link will be down below. Give this video a like if you liked it, if you like, and if you're new around here, press the subscribe button because we just hit 700,000 subscribers, which is mental. My feet are chilly because that knocks my socks off. Have a wonderful day, all the best, stay in touch, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye!